Yeah. Hi everyone and welcome to The Couch with Scorpion Raceway, the Zoom version. So tonight we're actually, well today for me, we're actually talking to Kate Dillon. Welcome Kate. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Sorry I'm so far away and we can't hang out on the couch. Hey look, it's, it's what it is these days. We can't do anything about it. We just got to deal with what we can at the moment. So Kate, can you um, just inform everyone what you actually do for a living um, and why we actually have you on here tonight? Great. Well, I do a few different things. There's a reason why I'm here, but my main business, I sell race car parts online. I, I run CrateInsider.com and I also started a program where, it, where I teach racers about marketing and sponsorship and that is on my winning motorsports marketing website. So winningmotorsportsmarketing.com and I, um, I do have katedillon.com as well where I teach entrepreneurs, but mostly we're here because of my winning motorsports marketing um, knowledge that I put out there. Yes, that's, that's the main reason. It, we don't actually be able to sell, obviously buy a lot of your stuff from over here in Australia. So we are definitely here to talk about the proposal side of your thing. So give us an idea of what that actually represents In what do you, you focus on in those areas? Uh, a lot of times what I focus on is I focus on helping racers to learn the tools and techniques of digital marketing in a lot of ways. So how are you able to promote yourselves and your sponsors, especially through social media? Social media is such a powerful tool we have today, um, you know, with things like Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. And so we want to, you know, especially video, I push video hard because video is so incredibly powerful today. It's how I've built a business. Um, out of nothing. I mean, it literally didn't exist seven years ago. And yeah, so that's, <laughs> so mostly video, but, but I also teach other things too, you know, how to connect with sponsors and how to, how to really service them, service your fans, you know, build up the racetracks. I, my goal is I want to really help the racing industry because if each of these racers can bring more sponsorship dollars into the sport, then will there'll be more for everybody and so my big goal is i want to reach ten thousand racers because even those ten thousand racers get their first thousand dollars in sponsorship that is ten million dollars into our sport so and i know i'm speaking in dollars i don't know what kind of currency you use is it what do you use for currency we use dollars. We use dollars. Oh, okay. it's just aussie dollars and it's not as good as the american dollar <laughs> <That's what laughs> comes to i think we're at around 0. 0.665 or something to the aussie to the american dollar at the moment but gotcha. Yeah. Sometimes. So yeah. Sometimes. Bigger, my bigger mission is I want to help the industry. And this is stuff I do every single day. So uh, seeing the frustration from manufacturers, especially that have the sponsor drivers and seeing that not pay off, feeling the disappointment that I've had along the way with, you know, believing somebody was going to do something great for my company only to be incredibly disappointed. And I can tell a few of those stories. Yeah. And I just don't want to see it happen anymore. And there's no excuse for it when you actually know that there's a difference. That's right. We, um, I, I come from the racing background. I had an accident and I've retired. Um, that was like four or five years ago now. And I switched over to what I'm doing now. So it's a completely different side for me. But I am seeing the difference what I did back then, what I shouldn't have done, to what I received now. So give us an idea, just a couple of ideas, because I know you, we, we should ask people to go to your site and, and, and join, but give us a couple of ideas of, say, the, the two biggest goals that they should look at when they're doing a proposal. The very, very first, if you remember one thing from this entire interview, it's going to be the phrase, lead with value. Lead with value. It's, this is not about what you're asking from a sponsor. It's not about your history as a racer. It's not about how many championships you've won. What it is about is what you can do for someone else. What is it that you can provide to them? And if I can give a second point of that, what is it you can do for them that they can't do for themselves? So those are kind of ethereal concepts, but if I'm doing a sponsor, if I'm doing a sponsorship proposal, um, I'm going to go to, let's say a manufacturer or someone local and I'm going to lead with value. First of all, I'm, I'm going to say, hey, I know your restaurant has been beat up by this whole coronavirus thing, and we want to get more people in the seats. I love your restaurant. I love eating here. Here's what I'd like to do. 
I would, I have an audience that is 10,000 people. I know you've got like 5,000 people on Facebook. I have 10. So why don't I do a post about your restaurant? We could even talk about one of your specials and I can recommend it to other people. Now, uh, that's just an example. But from that, first of all, we're leading with value. It's, we're leading with what it is that I can do for you. But more than that, it's because I can do something for you that you can't do for yourself. And the example that I love to give is I don't care what it is that you're buying. Let's, let's say you're buying a piece of furniture. This is an ex example I've used before. So if you go to the manufacturer's website and the, and the manufacturer's website says, this is the most amazing chair we've ever designed or built. Fantastic, fabulous materials, really comfortable to sit in. That's the manufacturer saying it, right? So then maybe you go to a retailer's website and you see that same chair. And on there, they say, oh, this is, you know, one of our most popular chairs. Uh, you know, we love selling it. It works with so many different interiors, whatever they want to say about it. So we listen to that and go, okay, sound like a good chair. But then we look at the reviews. And when we see that there's a consumer, you know, so obviously the manufacturer wants to sell us the chair. The retailer wants to sell us the chair. But when you look at the reviews and there's a consumer on there, whether there's a consumer that says, wow, this is just as good as the description. It was easy to put together. It arrived, you know, shipping was fast. It was, it was uh, just as luxurious as I thought. The fabric is just like what was in the picture. I absolutely love it. I would buy it again. Which of those areas has the most weight? You know, and conversely, if you see a consumer review that says, oh my gosh, yeah, it looks like the picture, but my God, it feels cheap. I mean, once you put it together, it is just junk. It is not comfortable to sit in, all of those things. So, so what I'm saying from all of this is you as a racer, you, you build up a following and these people trust you. They trust your opinion. And when you tell them, hey, wow, this is, this is the best sandwich in town, or I can choose from any radiator to put in my car, but this is the radiator I choose for my car, and here's why, then your opinion has far more weight than no matter how many advertising dollars that the retailers and manufacturers want to put out there. So that is the value that you have as a racer. But that value is really dependent upon you having an audience that you talk to. You know, if you're a racer that just goes out there and just wins races and you don't really have a connection with your fans, and, and that's really what we've seen is a big change. You know, when I was growing up, my dad was a race car driver. And back in those days, it really was, you know, put a sticker on a car. Well, actually, stickers didn't exist in the 80s. It was, you literally painted on the on. logos, right? <laughs> So entirely different world, but you know, let's go into the eighties and nineties and it became, you know, you want to be seen. And, and I've been there. I mean, as Crate Insider, the first time my logo was on a race car, I mean, I posed with it because I was excited. I felt like it, as a sponsor, I felt like I'd arrived, you know, like, oh my gosh, I've achieved something. This, it feels amazing to me. Right. But did it bring me more business? You know, that as I matured, and as my business matured, as I worked hard to build up a following of 20,000 Facebook followers and, you know, build up an email list and, and where I am today with that, um, with, with that business, you know, you got to kind of, you have to really step up in order to impress me because I know how hard it was to do that work. Um, and I value my customer reviews. So anyway, the, the point is that sticker thing, that was great back in the day. The idea of a rolling billboard. That all of that was fantastic pre social media. Yep. Now that we have social media, that's the thing that changed the game. And the old school people are being left behind and they're going to be beat out by newer, less talented. It honestly, it doesn't matter as much. All, okay, I will give you a caveat. Sometimes it matters if you're a championship racer, if you're a racer who wins all the time. And where that matters is if you are trying to promote performance products. If the product is directly tied to, hey, our product is awesome and you're going to win races, then it is important that you are, you know, always in the victory lane or winner circle. But when we're talking about some of your local businesses, it matters more that you're going to show up at their business and sign autographs. 
It matters more that you're going to talk about that on social media. It matters more that you're going to bring up your Instagram stories and do a little walkthrough of being in the restaurant or in the place of business that has more value because honestly, it doesn't matter. Um, it, whether you win or lose a race, doesn't matter as far as like, did the sandwich do that? I mean, nobody think, thinks for a second. Now, if you do win a race, you can say, hey, wow, I was powered by these sandwiches that are the best thing around. I mean, you, you can turn it either way you want. Yeah. Um, but, but that is the difference there. Yeah. Well, okay. Now, I must admit, I was, I was speaking to one of my, um, one of my supported members uh, just the other day, and I said to him, next time you go into your, one of your um, autobahn over here, which is a parts supplier, I said, take a photo of the, of the front of the, of, of the, the, the facade and said, just put, do a post, being to a supported driver, blah, 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 here. And it's as simple as that. It's, people seem to think that it takes forever to do something when it's a, a five second photo and a 10 second post and you send it away and then you ta hashtag your supplier in and they love it. And that's what I social media is now about. I 100% agree. You know, um, I'm going to show you an example because I think this ends up being video, right? You, do you do video or is this audio only? I this don't is, know. Yeah, this so. is definitely video. Okay, great. So like, here's an example. This is something I did the other night is um, we went out, we, we used to play trivia every Tuesday night at a local pub, pub here. And of course, you know, all of our restaurants have been shut down and all of that. So I've been really working hard every time we go out, not every single time, but most of the time, even getting stuff for lunch or whatever, exactly what you just said is taking a quick picture. But what I want to show you from this is, you know, hey, finally a night with friends. This was on my Instagram stories. There it says yeah. Amendment 21. That's the name of the restaurant. Yeah. Obviously, I'm drinking a Guinness. And then I tag them. So I've tagged the town and I've tagged the restaurant as well. And then they were able to share that to their story. Yeah. And, and I don't, did one more person come into the restaurant because of me? I don't know. I, I really don't. But all I can do is, is put that out there. Maybe there's somebody that's scrolling through Instagram or Facebook saying, gosh, where do I want to eat tonight? And then they come across my story and go, oh, right. That, that's right. That, oh, that place. We could go there tonight. You well, know, I, maybe I just spark something there. I must admit, I, I did see it and I went, ooh, Guinness, ooh, I don't know about that one. But I took the rest of it yeah. off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and whatever it is, you know, and, and all of those things, though, that can, the, the thing about, like, even this post is it does help me connect with my audience. This is my personal Instagram here. And if, you know, there's going to be people that, are going to be like, oh no, I don't like Guinness, but then there's the people who, who do like Guinness, who are gonna send me a message. And maybe sometimes maybe I'll tag Guinness in it and be like, hey, enjoying this great, you know, at Guinness, you know, at Amendment 21, whatever. Um, who knows? I mean, not, not that Guinness has ever featured me or shared my story. But it can happen, it can happen, right? <laughs> but it's, it's those little things that help connect you with your audience because it's one thing to build the audience, but then we have to be able to connect with them as well. And, and that means, you know, are you a cat person or a dog person? You know, oh. do you wake up early in the morning or are you, a, are you a night owl? You know, those little things that you can share about yourself help to connect you with that person in a, in a deeper way. You know, <laughs> like you almost feel like you're BFFs after a while. It's, it's a lot of fun. One, one of the biggest things that I, I've noticed, and uh, I, I know you've spoken about this before when on, on your pages, um, people are concerned to say, well, if I post something up, no one's going to see it because I'm only, I've only got a thousand Facebook members. Like the other week, we hit 4,000 on our Facebook page. And I was over the, over the moon, like I was absolutely wrapped. A little company like me that I do everything was hit 4,000. We were wrapped. It's not about the people... What well, this is why I feel it's not about how many you've got, it's how many you can connect. If you can connect to one person, that person then shares that on, it's their amount that you've got, then the next person shares, and it's that's part where you start to build everything. Mm -hmm. It really is, and it really is a game of patience and consistency, those are so vital. And I have pages and profiles. I mean, like all across the spectrum. So I don't want to sound like I'm coming from this place. You know, my main page, yeah, has 20,000 Facebook fans. And I will agree that it was a lot easier to build a fan base five years ago than it is today. Mm -hmm. So we, what we still need to do though, is we need to show up and we need to show up, 
consistently. It helps if you add some video. It helps even more if you do some live video. And for the time being, you can also share things over to your personal profile. That's something I do quite often um, because my personal profile is, I've got the 5,000 friends limit. And so now I really wanna direct people over, I wanna direct them to what's gonna be most interesting to them. So if they are a racer, then direct them over to Winning Motorsports Marketing. Or if they're an entrepreneur or starting a business, um, I talk about things like that over on my Kate Dillon page. And sometimes I cross those over too. And, and what I want to really, when we look at YouTube as well, YouTube can be tough to build up a following. I've been at this for, oh, I think I posted my first video in 2015. And you know, if you want to use YouTube as like this big money-making strategy, um, then, you know, there's, there are possibilities. The things that I do are unlikely to go viral. Uh, it's not really very likely, but you know, on our main page, we've reached like 1200 subscribers and we've gotten the watch hours so I can add ads and all of that. Now, the same token, I have three other YouTube channels and one of them I just started, oh, like three weeks ago and it is up to like 50 subscribers and I'm thrilled. You know, I'm thrilled. That's going to make a difference in those people's lives. And like you mentioned, you know, I could talk to an audience if I, if I just wanted a big audience. You know, let's say I could go to a high school and, and talk to a group of high schoolers, you know, 500 house, high schoolers and talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. Now, they're not really an engaged audience. They don't care about me. So it's really not about the numbers. You know, how, how many people do you really need to speak to? Um, like even in my main business, I deal with guys that are race car drivers who drive crate engines, you know, the GM 602s, GM 604s and CT 525s. That's it. I mean, if you've got a go-kart, you know, yay, but you're not my customer. Um, fans, not my customers. So I don't want a hundred thousand random fans on my Crate Insider Facebook page. I would rather, I want 20,000 people who are actual racers. The rest is just garbage. Um, I mean, people aren't garbage, don't get me wrong, but I only want the right fans for what I'm connecting with. Let's, well, let's talk about that because I was going to lead into giving us two negative things that people do on proposals or on social media. <laughs> we might actually move with that, tie that in to a video <laughs> you did on the 14th of December. Now, <laughs> I bring this video up. It was a, it was a rant. Let's, let's be honest. But it was. it was every sponsor's rant that every, anyone would want to say. Um, I was laughing my head off. I was showing my wife and I, was, I actually, I think I started tearing up in the end because I was just laughing so much. Can you explain what the video is? And if people want later on, we'll hook that link into the, the um, view so they can see, but please tell me all about that one. Yeah. So here's what happened. So in, in that particular video, like a lot of videos I actually record, um, right now we're on a webcam. I use DSLR cameras. I use whatever camera is right in front of me. That's the camera that I use. And I happen to be at the performance racing industry trade show. So PRI, I always get there a couple of days early to get prepared. I shoot a lot, a lot of video there and make deals with manufacturers and the whole deal. And so I had some time and I was in the lobby, so which is why there's this giant poinsettia Christmas tree in the background. And I received this sponsorship proposal request on my phone. And I was like, this is, they made it look pretty. I mean, at least there was a little bit of effort. I could go on and on and on about way worse ways, but it was really offensive. And what happened was they said, you know, hey, um, you should sponsor our race team because we can put you on the map. <laughs> okay, if you're gonna put me on the map, are you telling me that I'm absolutely nobody? I mean, is, is that where we're going with this here? You're gonna put me on the map. Do you even know who I am or what I do? Like, you know, how insulting could you possibly be that, that they're going to be the difference between me succeeding and failing and I have more Facebook followers than they do? So, so how is it that you, race team, and I don't even think the guy even had a crate engine. It, you just went shopping for, you didn't ever address anything to me particular. This was your boilerplate proposal that you somehow got my email address and you just sent it out. You, you did what I call the spray and pray method where you just spray it out to the world and pray that somebody's gonna get back to you. It was 
it was really bad and it was offensive. And what happened from that video, so I shoot that video and I went ahead and, and just did a quick edit and put it up on YouTube. And oh my God, the response was incredible. I am walking around PRI and these manufacturers, they were um, people that I deal with because I, you know, I deal with all these, manu so many of these manufacturers and they're stopping me and they're like, oh my God, I can't like your video or I can't comment on it, but damn, you nailed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. it, it see, being, like I said before, being a racer and being on the other side now, and some of the proposals that we get, like last season, we, we do our support program here at Scorpion Racewear. It's a little bit different than what we norm, a normal propose, uh, sponsorship is, but we just find it's better for us at the moment to do it this way. Um, we got 75 proposals in, in for the support program last season, which was massive. Like this is absolutely massive for us. Um, but some of them can go from a, a quarter page with some writing, or some can be 20 pages long. There's no, yeah. and some of them are just rude. They go, oh, who may concern? I love that one. That one just, they didn't even research my name or the company. They said, who, who this may concern? I hate that. Throwing the yeah. bin before I even look at it. And that's, that's the frustrating part about being on this side now. I honestly, like I said, I've seen the mistakes I did to what I do now. And that's why I'd like, um, what we'll do is we'll get you to later on to put up the link when I put this up. I'll get you to put the links up because you've got so many links. <laughs> I'll miss some somewhere. <laughs> I'll send you the laundry list. I know. <laughs> but also, okay. talking about that, what would be two main problems that people do when they do a proposal? Like to a sponsor, what is the two biggest things that really turn sponsors off? Would you say? Uh, I think the number one thing, you know, just like we talked about leading with value, that's incredibly important. But I, right, like right in there with that is show how it's relevant. I mean, be relevant to the person that you're reaching out to. You know, how does what you do relate? And go ahead and put those pieces together. You know, so as I mentioned, this person that reached out that just wanted free, you know, they don't want sponsorship, they just want charity. They want uh, free stuff. So that's what they want. They just want, I don't know if we can swear on your podcast, so I'm gonna try to, they want free stuff. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they didn't want free stuff. That's it. So, you know, are you relevant to this sponsor and go ahead and put those pieces together from the very beginning and let them know why. So, you know, do you use their product, give them a compliment and to be able to say, Hey, wow. Um, I'm a customer of yours. I love what you're doing. You know, I, I don't really see your company well represented in where I'm at and I would love to, you know, be a part of, you know, work with you and, you know, get more of my competitors to use your products. Okay. First of all, you're giving me a compliment. I'm going to listen. You're, you're not insulting me and you've shown that you're relevant. I think the really, really big one here now, again, it always depends on the type of sponsorship we're looking at, but I, I kind of have a rhetorical question here to throw out there as me as a retailer. If I'm presented with a proposal from somebody who's never bought even a can of window cleaner from me, and they want me to now pay for their tires because they can, you know, bring me to a new area, like they can bring me up to New York or Maine or something like that. Okay, that's that's what they're leading with, right? You know, hey, sponsor me. Never bought anything from you, but you know, I could help you up in Maine. Now I compare that to someone who's bought two or three engines from me. Somebody who tags me every single week, even though I've never given them a dime. They tag me when I'm in victory lane. They, uh, when they maybe open up a box and they talk about how they, have they bought their front drive kit from Crate Insider. Who am I going to pick? Is it, what kind of a jerk am I if I get like, I'm not even going to say it's greedy because truthfully the person has a, the person in Maine hasn't proven themselves in any way, shape or form. But how fair is it for me to give to someone who's never even, even taken the time to do business with me versus one of my most loyal customers. Yeah. You know, I am definitely going to be feeding from the loyal customer, per, you know, that group long before I pick somebody off of the street. Why should I? Exactly. Why should I? It's with like my support program. A lot of the guys that we deal with, they've been with me now for five years. 
and they just keep supporting you and they just keep throwing the name out there. And people say, oh, you've had these on your program for so long. I says, yeah, well, they do what we ask. They do more than what I ask in some cases. And you just, yeah. it's a loyalty thing as well. It's like a family in a sense that sometimes you have people that you go to the speedway. I don't see these people at all during the week. I go to the speedway, it's like I'm my best mate again. We're there together. We talk, we talk about racing and, and everything like that. So when people propose stuff to you, sometimes it just feels rude. Oh, I agree. I, you know, I think um, something that a lot of people, a lot of racers don't know is they don't really think about the fact that so many of us talk to each other behind yeah. the scenes. Um, they're completely unaware that, you know, because what happens, you know, I, as a retailer, uh, that I am ordering product. I'm not just ordering one of something. I'm ordering, you know, 10, dozens, hundreds, whatever it is. So when you do that enough, you develop relationships with the manufacturers that you're working with. I mean, you, there's, it is unavoidable to have that many transactions and not have a relationship. So, you know, make sure you're good to anybody you come in contact with because it can burn you later on. You know, if, if I see where there's, if I see a post that my buddy's been, been tagged in and this racer asks me for a sponsorship, and I honestly don't do a lot of sponsorship. I'd rather teach people sponsorship. Um, I do connect some of my uh, people in my program, it, I get contacted by manufacturers or, or groups saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some brand ambassadors. Can you recommend somebody? Well, obviously, I'm going to recommend people that I know and can trust and aren't going to give me a bad name, right? Yeah. So I do a little bit of recommendations, but I, you know, I don't necessarily, I'm not a sponsorship broker. But what I will say is that, you know, like my friend Dave Hammond from Hammond Motorsports, anytime there's something going on, he and I will compare notes on it, you know, like, Hey, have you ever done any business with this guy? Well, we even do it where who we're going to make a dealer and who we're not. Be like, hey, have you worked with this guy before? Oh, you know, no, or I did have, or, you know, who can I trust and who can I not? Because loyalty is a huge issue in racing. And oh my God, because there's so little of it. There's, there's so little loyalty that the little bit of loyalty that's out there, we can greatly appreciate it, but it's a great way for you to burn yourself too. If you're not one of those loyal people who's just going to jump ship and do what I call tripping over a dollar to pick up a dime, you know, you're, you know, you, you're going to, Oh my God, he's going to give me free shipping. So I'm going to go there, but he's not going to support, you know, racing or anything, you know, looking for the, the cheap win, the quick buck, whatever is not going to serve you long-term. We're talking about that then. One of the things that you do bring up is return on investment from a sponsor, from the, mm -hmm. from the racer, from the sponsor, either way. What, what, uh, what I'm trying to look for is what percentages and stuff do you actually, you actually put it down as a percentage? What, did, what do you yeah. put it down as? Um, I put it down as two to 10 times the amount of the sponsorship. So a lot of times it, it's the inverse of, of a racer asking, well, how much should I ask for, right? <laughs> So if we look at how much should you ask for as a result of how much you think you're going to be able to offer to someone else, and the two to 10 times kind of depends on the price point, right? So if the, if the price point of a product, let's, let's say that you're dealing with a, um, uh, we'll, we'll go to service-based businesses in a minute, but if we're dealing with a product-based business and they have items that are like under a thousand dollars, then you should really be looking at probably about a five times return. So if they give you a thousand dollars, you should be able to promote them to the point that they get five thousand dollars in sales. Does that? Does that? I don't know if I explained that super clearly. Yeah, that's fine. I, I understand uh, directly. Yeah, but if you know if somebody has a lesser, uh, a less expensive product, you know, like uh, I'm notorious for just grabbing stuff off my desk here and just making stuff up about it. So let's say they sell journals and let's say these journals are $20 a piece, right? And they're going to give you $1,000. Well, because this is a lower price point, in my opinion, you should be selling a lot more of them. You'll be able to promote them. It'll be easier to sell just because it's at a lower price point. So that for that $1,000, you really should be able to return, you know, $10,000 to them um, for that be, it, or somewhere in that range. Really, it really depends. But as as price points get higher, then you have uh, you tend to have a more 
a, a smaller customer base that it affects. Yep. So is your is the product mainstream or is it very specific? Is you know, and with race car parts, for instance, um, anything that's with manufacturing, you know, we're talking about um, it's a, this is a consumer item. You can you can definitely promote consumer items to a much larger audience yep. than you can a race car part that you know only applies to race car drivers. So two to ten times of whatever they are going to provide with you, you want to be able to return to them. That's the price point we're looking at. Um, yep. Yeah, and then, can I go talk about the service piece of it for a second? So there's another piece of it that people look at as well, which isn't, is a return on investment, but it's a slightly different thing. A lot of this is about picking up the phone and talking to a potential sponsor and finding out what is important to them. So let's say you're gonna deal with like a excavating company, right? Well, an excavating company, they're not gonna have the, they don't have like a product, like a journal or, or a part that you can sell. A lot of times their business is built on relationships. So if you've got a really close connection, let's say, let's say your uh, family is involved in construction. Well, you have the ability to make a connection and you can connect that excavating company with another company, whether it's a development company. Oh, wow, you know, we've got this construction company. We deal with these developers over here, you know, let's see what we can do about connecting the two of you. And that would be part of the sponsorship, you know, hey, you can come to the race, I want you to meet, you know, have a beer with this guy. Because that's how a lot of those deals are done is people meeting in casual circumstances. That's like why your chamber of commerce events are so, so important, but you're basically creating your own little chamber of commerce event. Um, that's one kind of a business. And then let's look at a different kind of manufacturing for a second too. Maybe you have a company that has um, a lot of employees. Well, what they might want to do, or even a smaller company that has a, has a smaller amount of employees. I used to work in an architectural firm and something that the, that, uh, the regional baseball team came to my boss and said, Hey, you know, why don't you bring your all of your employees and their families and come out to the race to the baseball game for a night and have this whole team building thing. Well, that's more important to my boss than just, we, we were very specific commercial architecture, right? I mean, we, we did grocery store remodels. So advertising at the, at the baseball game was no, probably not going to bring in any business into the door. And it wasn't going to be any business that we would, we would even be able to do because we were large commercial. We had like three major clients, right? So for that baseball team to get sponsorship from this architectural firm, they found a different way to get that sponsorship money. So yes, we had the big billboard with the architectural firm's name on it, but what they got out of it was we had this team building event that we we're still talking about years and years later. So, so much of this depends on what's important to that sponsor and not all sponsors are alike not all of them have the same needs and you kind of got to have that conversation with them to find out you know what is going to be the most important to them and how you can service that yeah now let's talk about the uh the thing that's happening all over the world at the moment COVID 19. now mm -hmm. how's that affecting you over in america compared to um, we'll explain what we've been able to do here for the speedway side of things how so how has it affected you personally um, with your business and everything, and what's going on with Speedway over there? Sure. Uh, so we've been in lockdown. I live in North Carolina, um, is as far as the state. So, in and I live in a really small town. I think we might have. I haven't looked at the latest. They had a drive-through testing location today, so who knows? But um, it, about the time that we should have been opening up is uh, is when our governor kept it in lockdown, and and it's all the whole pandemic has really turned into nothing but politics over here. And then now we've got riots breaking out over police brutality in Minnesota. So, I mean, I, we're a huge country. I think we're about the same size as you guys are. So yeah, for same size, but I think you're about 10 times the population. Oh, well, yeah, because all of your population is all like, there's Australia on, on, the border, like, on the border, yeah, on the border, something on the border, right? Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're spread out and, and we also have so many different cultures here so many and it's really hard to explain but but the on the highest level uh, we were in 
lockdown. You can just go to the grocery store. All the restaurants are shut down. Couldn't race. Yeah. You know, everything was was shut down and then they extended it for some more time. So like my race car parts business, I mean, we were down just because people aren't racing. This is when, I mean, my busiest month of the year is March as people are getting their race cars, those final things that they're putting together to go racing. And, you know, just so much like just wondering what's going on. Now we're, have, we're starting to have races, a lot of places without fans is yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. And you've got to shift gears on that. And And actually I do have like, seven things a racer can be doing now even if you don't have fans in the stands uh that i mean i obviously we want to connect with fans in person and do all those things uh so my business was down i'm finding that now our business is picking back up the deficit we created from you know when we compared last year's sales to this year's sales i mean it was one of those graphs where i was just seeing it that gap getting bigger and bigger and bigger by the day. Yeah. And then now I'm seeing it shrink, 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 shrink. And in fact, my May sales, um, because we're talking here on May 29th, my May sales for 2020 are better than what my May sales for 20, 2019 were. Uh, and yeah, I didn't look at the percentage, but pretty good percentage too. So, um, so we're starting to recover in that way. We're starting to open up. We can only go to restaurants with the social distancing, um, masks are a big hot button political issue here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the open up. This isn't as bad as they thought. And m masks are just, no. I mean, it, it, I'm respectful. Like I go to the farmer's market on Saturdays. And if people were scared, I would do it because I care about those people. And I'd, I'd put a mask on if I needed to. I've got a checkered flag one that I made. But I have zero confidence in it. There's so much pumped up. Um, and you know, I don't care what you say at this point, it's, it's a time to move on and, and get it a going. And I feel so bad for the business owners. I'm getting my hair done finally on Monday with my, uh, this is me for the first That's time. Essential. Showing the That's the essential for the ladies, isn't it? Oh my gosh. You know, I mean, we got, we got standards, right? And normally I wear a hat. I've been wearing a hat hey, as like a protest. I expect you to wear a hat. I even bought one just in case. Oh, I've got one. I've got, what did I do with it? Where did it go? Well, nothing else. Well, that lady. Oh, look at the, oh, I was, I'm always, there we go. We've got my crate ah, inside of right that. Out. I wanted to be glary yeah. on that, but <laughs> there we go. But um, also, like we've asked, we've been lucky in the sense that we kind of lost our last, probably about the last third of our season over here. Um, so we're actually in our off season. So it's kind of not bad for us in that aspect. Um, some of the local tracks here are looking at around September opening up, which is standard out, standard time of practice in October starting up again. So we'll see how our thing goes. But we're only getting two or three um, uh, viruses through persons over the Australia these days. It's not much for us, but we're slowly opening up. We're going back to, I think, 50 people for gatherings and stuff like that as of next week. So we're, we're actually improving. So for once, uh, everyone over in America, be safe. <laughs> What's all we can do? It's not much we can all do at the moment. Um, we might leave it at that there, Kate. I reckon that's been an actually really cool, cool interview. And thank you very much for that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I love the fact that we connected and we connected, I think, originally on the Winning Motorsports Marketing Facebook group. I, yeah. I don't know how you found me or, or I, how. I was, I was flicking. <laughs> Just, I think I was, um, if I remember correctly, I was, I was away on a business trip and I was bored sitting in a motel. And um, not for this, not for Scorpion Race, went for my normal day job. And um, I was just flicking through and I seen it and I watched it. And I, this is really good because it's based on what I'm doing. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can. You know, I'm an old man. I need to learn as much as I can from anyone. And uh, yeah, I found it and I started, I sent you a text and we started chatting. And it's just gone on from there. So. I have to say that's one other takeaway from this whole COVID thing is that there have been friendships that I've lost over it because people have such diverse viewpoints. Um, I had a neighbor who just wanted to be paranoid and just wants to complain about everything. So we're not friends anymore. But I found that some other friendships started that really grew a lot deeper than what they were before. You know, and you and I have text messaged a little bit and now we'll be greater friends from this. So, so I think there's a you know, it's, it's good. I think it's good to weed out some of the people who don't belong in your life. And if this was the catalyst to make that happen, so be it. Oh. And um, I'm really happy. I'm so grateful to appreciate the friendships that have, have grown deeper 
and look forward to really focusing on those in the future. So I'm happy about that part. I, I am too. Like, I, in my wildest world, I didn't think I'd be doing a Zoom meeting to a person in America. So it's just something that where life's changed and you've just got to roll with the punches and change with them. Yeah, yeah. So That's the it, we made. I know you're wrapping it up, but like we just doubled down on content and just showed up showed up like we have never showed up before. Um, there is more videos and more content that we've created in the last two months than we've done for probably the last, I don't know how long. I mean, we're, we have like new videos going out almost every single day. Started a whole new, new live show that we do um, for Crate Insiders. And I've got two live shows a week. And, and it's made a difference. It's really made a difference. People, the number of messages that I've gotten that people will message and be like, wow, thank you so much for doing this. You know, really appreciate the show. And now they feel more connected to my business too. And it's just a good example of what a racer can do. If you're going to show up for your fans in, in whatever circumstances, you know, you are in the off season in Australia, just because the racing's over, you're more than just a race car. So show up now and just, you know, keep people, keep a little bit engaged, you know, let them know, like show them what you're doing in the off season. What does that look like? And just a couple minutes a day will make a huge, huge difference, especially as you roll into the race season ahead. Well, you, you, you um, like one of the posts I did yesterday about me, um, I'm actually painting my mate's car parts for him, for the race car parts. And it's new season starting because I'm painting cars parts again. So you can see it, it, it Everything relates to it. You just got to look for stuff and make things up now in a different way. That's all it is to it. Well, we all want to know. We yeah. all want to know the behind the scenes. We really, really do. Uh, it, you know, I love watching like the how stuff is made. I love all of that stuff. It's not just about the finished product. It's how did you get there? Yeah. You know, so, some of your fans are looking and thinking, mm, gosh, I would love to be a race car driver. Could I do it? And if they can see all the little pieces, maybe they'll self decide out. Like, I don't really want to race car. It's way too much work, but they can still feel part of it because they're there when you're opening up the box for this brand new, it's, it's like Christmas a lot when you're a race car driver, because well, yeah. you can't just get stuff out at the local store, right? One of our biggest, um, uh, followings and likes on a video was actually when we did a live stream of Hayden Pascoe, one of, who's my ambassador. We did um, his legend cart and we actually went into him. He was sitting in the car and we went in there and we showed what things he has to do when he was racing. You know, left foot braking, the, the gear lever, the brakes and the seat belts and everything. We talked about that and that just went ballistic with people watching it because it was just something that people wanted to see. What's different? It's just not a car going around a track what's he doing? And it was actually really well received that one. So we're going yeah, to do all I, those ones. I think it's, it just seems something that people want to know. Absolutely. We're totally interested in that kind of stuff. We want to see, we want to feel it's how do you make your audience feel? We want to feel like we're part of it. We want to feel, we're going to feel more important if we can feel like we know something that's a little bit secret. You know, if we can sit in the stands and say, you know, um, did you know how those, how those shift down there? Um, you know, I, I, I saw that guy's video right there and it does this and this and whatever. Um, you're smarter. And I always say in my videos, I want to either educate, inspire, or, um, in, or entertain, you know, I, any of those three things that I can do with a video and that can help a lot. So educate, inspire, or entertain. Good. All right, we'll leave it at that. We're, we're getting a bit onto the, the time and everything. So again, thank you very much for coming on. Um, obviously, now that we've got a bit more of connection, we'll probably chat more and text more. So, yes, absolutely. Like I said, yeah. the, the good thing about this is I'll throw something at you and you help me throw something back, which is really good because I've got someone that's, it's hard sometimes to sort some of the stuff I'm trying to sort out in my head. So it's good to throw something at people. Yeah, it, it, I always make a mistake of throwing a camera at me and, um, and not expecting me to talk. So <laughs> I, I, I can fill, fill some files there. Oh, we, we might have to catch up again later on in the uh, year and we'll talk how everything's going from there. So again, thank you very much, Kate. Um, and we'll um, catch up with you later. See ya. That was the plan. See you later. Bye.